About 1910, modern science became aware of the endocrine system. This does not mean they had not known about it before, but it had remained a comparatively quiet, dignified part of our anatomy and uh, was enjoying that uh, exclusiveness and seclusion which the body seems to prefer. Then all of a sudden, glands began to be very important. And in the 20 years following 1910, uh, the gland concept became high fiction. It was something like uh, spaceships in the 50s and 60s. Almost anything that you couldn't understand or you couldn't explain was a matter of glands. Uh, furthermore, a highly evolved technique for investigating glandular function and glandular structure uh, began to appear. Scientific papers were numerous. A group of scientists who called themselves endocrinologists appeared in the field of medicine, and we had almost the equivalent of the modern psychologist and now the modern exponent of wonder drugs. As always, man just went to excess. This does not mean that valuable information was not gained. It does mean, however, that there was not adequate criticism, very little basic understanding, and practically no basic interest in the glandular problem except on the purely physical level. We had uh, much discussion of uh, glands and uh, rejuvenation. We had glands advanced to explain the personality problems which are now in the province of psychology. In those days, a man was what his glands were. And whatever changes occurred in his life or personality or appearance, these changes were basically due to glands. The one problem that uh, confronted the endocrinologist from the very beginning was that one gland possibly the most important of all, just simply refused to reveal its secret. And for the most part, the condition is the same now, although a good many years have passed. Uh, the pineal or pineal gland, either pronunciation is correct, located in the central part of the brain, still remains the mystery gland of the human body. We sense, at least we think we do, that this gland, as long as it remains the most mysterious, is in all probability the most important. There is talk about this being the master gland of all, but it simply remains, even today, so mysterious, so difficult to work with, uh, that comparatively little important information has been accumulated about this gland. The others have given up some of their secrets at least, and we do know what we suspected from the beginning, that they were there for a good reason. Nature does not put anything into the human body without a purpose. A man can take very little out of the human body without getting into some kind of difficulty. The various glands tied together into a kind of pattern certainly were focal points for the distribu distribution of important secretions that affect health and well-being and contribute to a mysterious chemistry within the body. 
a chemistry which has as its essential purpose the maintenance of the equilibrium of function. The glands, therefore, act as regulators, distributors, integrators, organizers. And in their natural and proper functions, they are certainly of the utmost value. Yet with this general concept, we followed along the old accustomed way, which we are still following, to try to find out how we could influence these glands, how through various procedures we could become masters of their functions, so that we could direct, amplify, or reduce these functions by various scientific means. Here again, some definite good was achieved. And there are persons alive today in relatively good health who would not be here if it had not been for the endocrinologists. Sometimes we suspect, however, that there are some absences from among us <laughs> that might be attributed to the same cause. <laughs> so we are not certain that we are in the presence of a complete and uh, undoubted blessing. The difficulty seemed to be in the early area of research that it was all carried on by this splendid and brilliant group of materialists who could conceive of nothing of importance except physical symptoms and physical syndromes of one kind or another. To these people, the glands were a new way of trying to bring health to man by merely perpetuating the functions of his body. It was assumed that if you can save the body, you can save all. That if you can keep the body alive, the individual is alive. Here again, there is a broad point of doubt because there are many people whose bodies are undoubtedly functioning, and that is about all we can say for the individual. <laughs> we were not at that time very much interested in something that has later gained in fascination, namely the problem of the extrasensory uh, gamut in human consciousness. If we had been interested at that time and a little more sympathetic uh, endocrine research might have had a far happier, more brilliant existence. This does not mean that the subject is dead. It is far from dead. Work is continually going on, but it does not have the hypnotic fascination that it had uh, in the 30s and 40s. It is now moderating into a general program in which the glands are included with other subjects as well worthy of further thought. We do not have the mania on glands that we suffered from at that time. If this mania had become a more aware of the large picture or total subject, a very great deal of progress might have been accomplished, and it is even possible that at least one world war could have been prevented if we had really understood the glands of the human body. But we did not, and we were contented merely to search for means of treating immediate problems. Among the valuable byproducts of this research, undoubtedly, was research into the problem of diabetes and the development of insulin therapy. This is the type of thing which may be pointed out as the best that was achieved. There is much more, however, uh, to this great problem than the correction of physical ailments. Unfortunately, however, the public mind follows the scientific bent, and most people are far more interested in obscuring symptoms of existing troubles or of hopefully looking toward the remedying of some physical situation than they are in the search of the larger verities of human existence. 
So both supply and demand kept the entire research into the gland field largely on an objective physical level. Today we are probably more aware than ever before on a scientific level of the relationship between what we term consciousness and body. Now of course to the scientist for the most part consciousness is still a physical term. Mind is only a condition of matter. And in this uh, thinking we cannot entirely escape into the freer atmosphere of larger thinking. Still, however, we do have a new perspective, and that is the perspective of a person in a body. And we begin to realize that in some way this person must operate through the body which it inhabits. Therefore, all areas which may have a bearing upon this are becoming increasingly important to our thinking. The great French scientist whom we refer to in our book, philosopher-scientist René Descartes, was one of the first to express a series of rather, rather noble thoughts uh, bearing upon the relationship between consciousness and body. He declared that the anima or soul certainly uh, operated through the whole body, through all of its substances, its organs, its propensities, and its functions. But although this could be rather immediately accepted by the thoughtful, there was another more advanced question. If this operation was general throughout the body, there must be a controlling or directing center. Functions of all kinds arise from certain basic energy poles or fields within the body. Therefore, if the body is all responsive to soul, then there is this implication that there must also be a particular part of the body which is most particularly sensitive to soul, that there must be a headquarters, so to say, for this vast field operation. And it was Descartes' opinion that the pineal gland in the brain was this controlling center. He held this after a great deal of thought and consideration. He studied all of the principal centers of the body the organs, the nervous system, the arterial system, and he finally concluded that the larger and more massive structures could not be the controllers, but rather were the large reservoirs through which these controllers operated. That in all probability the controlling power would be posited in a comparatively small and sensitive area. Just as, for example, the very fact that man is alive is due to a very small and important area at the apex of the left ventricle of the heart. Uh, the area involved is probably not much more than the size of a small bean. Yet this is a controller, a very important dynamic. And if anything happens to this one controller, the rest of the body uh, ceases to function. Descartes, uh, continuing his analysis, came to the conclusion that in the brain there was an unpaired organ, that instead of the uh, organ being polarized or with two essential parts corresponding to the right and left sides of the brain, that was suspended almost in the middle of the brain, suspended in a manner in which it was capable of motion within the brain itself. A comparatively small and mysterious body, 
uh, which uh, resemble perhaps a small pine cone. And that this mysterious body, with an independent motion, held in position only by certain arteries and veins and nerves, was, in his mind, the most likely organ or center by means of which consciousness was able to impinge itself upon the body as a living structure. Therefore, that life came essentially from the heart. But from this other center came the power which transforms a living thing into a thinking, conscious being. He probably, Dr. Descartes, uh, was not merely conjecturing, not in the ordinary sense of invention. He was a very thoughtful man, a very widely read man, and a great student. There is no doubt in the world that he was well acquainted with the religious, philosophical, and scientific thoughts of ancient peoples. And while perhaps he did not have available as large an area of research as we have today, he had enough to convince him uh, that throughout ancient religions and mystical philosophies, uh, there was a lore or legendary by means of which the isolation of the area which he selected would be natural, reasonable, and probable. Perhaps Descartes did not even consciously do this, but out of his vast background, uh, this thinking was almost inevitable as a subconscious process in himself. From the very earliest time, men have used the concept of the I, in this case E-Y-E, as a symbol of consciousness, of internal awareness. In India, an extra eye, a third eye, is placed on the forehead or higher upon the head of a deity to indicate, one would say, a power of superior sight, knowing, or insight. In the religious mysticism of Christianity, the head itself is surrounded by the nimbus of sanctity. Now, Descartes was a Roman Catholic, and therefore it is quite reasonable and probable that he was aware of the ancient symbolism associated with the canonization of a saint. Now, all through art, not only Christian art, but also Buddhist art and the arts of other Oriental peoples, sanctification is artistically presented or represented by adding around the head of the person a halo. In the uh, development of the idea of canonization, it developed quite a science of halos. All halos, aureoles, and similar luminous and envelopes or surrounding light patterns are according to certain rules or designs. If you study ancient art, you will see, for example, that the persons of the Trinity representing the Godhead, if personified, are usually given a certain kind of halo, that the halo of Christ is different from that of any of his apostles, and that the halos of saints are again different from those of angels, archangels, or other so-called celestial beings. Descartes was undoubtedly aware that if he took the halo around the head, and regarded it as an area or a circumference, and he placed a compass so that he could draw this halo, which the artist placed around the head, that the central point of his compass, upon which he was to base 
the circumference, would lie in the head or approximate the position in the skull of the pineal gland. Therefore, that this luminosity was radiating from a center almost in the exact middle of the brain. Now, this luminosity we conceive of, probably, as being simply an art symbolism. And I think certainly it would be so regarded by most scientists. At the same time, these symbols are archetypal. They go back to a very ancient pattern in human thinking. Therefore, I don't believe that we can simply assume that these symbols are arbitrary. Rather, the ancient attempted to indicate by the halo or aura around the head a state of sanctity. He did not put this aura somewhere else. Strangely enough, he did not put it around the heart. Sometimes, of course, he will make a larger halo. And in Eastern, particularly Buddhist symbolism, it is quite common to find a double halo. One obviously from the heart, the other from the brain. These two halos form a very pleasant artistic design and are noted in the shrines and images of many of the Buddhistic divinities. However, the halo around the head is derived from rather ancient thinking and from a still older patterns of belief or attitude. In the Egyptian religion, for example, we find a definite use of a peculiar kind of ornament that is placed on the exact crown of the head, a tiny little mound-like structure resemb resembling a tiny beehive. And on the top of this is placed, usually, a conventionalized lotus blossom or lotus uh, branch. Now, we say branch, fully realizing that that is not the way we generally recognize a lotus. But in Oriental art, it is usually a peculiar type of hybrid in which the lotus symbol is combined with a type of stem and leaf that suggests the acanthus rather than the lotus itself. Now, in this particular case, the deceased person passing into the underworld has this peculiar device fastened to the top of the head. The deities involved are frequently ornamented with crowns or symbols. And these symbols include a mysterious something resembling a kind of antenna placed in the top of the crown of the deity approximately in the same relationship as the feather in the hair dress of the Indian medicine priest. Now, in American Indian lore, uh, the war chieftains always wore the bonnet. This was a circle, usually, of eagle feathers, forming a very elaborate headdress. This bonnet uh, often also included an appendage of more feathers down the back until perhaps almost reaching the ground. But a mystic, a medicine priest, or a holy man could not wear this bonnet. That was the bonnet of the war chief. The symbol of the holy man was a single feather rising directly from the top back of the head exactly where if the stem of the feather continued into the head, we would assume the pineal gland to be. This was a sign of divine protection. It was a sign of dedication to God. This feather, by the way, served a number of protective purposes. For in the old tribal warfare, uh, the chieftain with the uh, war bonnet was always vulnerable. Anyone who wanted to take a shot at him could do so. But it was very bad taste to shoot the man who had one feather in his hair because it meant you were shooting a priest. Therefore, normally, no one attacked him. 
and actually he never carried arms himself. He was sacrosanct. He was set apart. And to injure the agent of the deity was a very serious offense. Descartes also well knew that from very old times the tonsure was an important symbol, not only in Christian religion, but in other religions. This consists of shaving or removing the hair from a small circle at the crown of the head. This was again a setting aside of the individual for religious purposes. It was a very peculiar but important symbol. Some feel that it was an effort to capture an idea and that this idea was that the child's skull in small childhood or infancy did not entirely and immediately close, but that at the crown of the head through uh, small childhood there was a soft area where the skull bones had not joined. And it was a belief among many gypsies and other people that all children were clairvoyant until this skull closed over. Therefore, again, there was something mystical about this area in the top of the head. Uh, down in the uh, Casa Grande area in our own southwest, uh, the dead were buried in what was, was called the embryo posture, which is a kind of knee chest posture, as the embryo is supposed to be in the womb. This was in order to emphasize the belief that the dead person or deceased person was beginning a new infant life in the other world. Therefore, that he was being born into another world and that the earth became the second womb of his life. When he was so placed, a bowl it was inverted over his head, forming a kind of cap. But before this is, was done, a hole was knocked in the bottom of the bowl so that there would be a space at the top of the head through which his soul might escape. Uh, the belief being that the soul left the body at that area at the crown of the head. This, of course, is completely carried on in the religion and philosophy of Vedanta and Yoga. In the Mexican Museum of Archaeology in Mexico City, there is a magnificent monolithic head, uh, probably of Mexican jadeite. Uh, this head is called Morning Star. It is more than twice life size, perhaps four times life size. But there never was any body with it because the undersurface of it is also carved and figured. Where the neck would join, there are elaborate glyphs covering the entire bottom of the head. And the heads of this nature, even larger, have been found along the coast of Mexico on the Gulf side south of Veracruz. The top or headdress of this figure, Morning Star, is a magnificent sunburst resembling a many-petaled lotus almost identical in design to that frequently found on the cases of Egyptian mummies. It is as though an, an inverted lotus bowl had been placed over the head. In the center of the area where the petals came together uh, was an open circle, the Chinese symbol of life, the vacant center in the mysterious Chinese uh, plaque, which was used to represent deity. And in the case of the mummy, the Egyptian mummy, this central circle was usually painted deep blue, an azure color, to symbolize heaven or life or consciousness. We can go through 50 such parallels, all of which, to a degree at least, were available to uh, Descartes. Also, we have another entire group of symbols, referred to, of course, originally in the Bible. The mystery of the eye single, the mystery of the all-seeing eye of the Masonic lodges, the mystery of the same all-seeing eye that is found frequently in the artistry of cathedrals and other religious edifices, sometimes placed within a triangle, 
a triangle being basically, for one reason or another, used frequently to describe the shape of the third ventricle in the brain. This eye, single, is a mysterious kind of eye. We do not know just exactly what the Bible meant when it said, If thine eye be single, thy body shall be filled with light. But it doesn't apparently mean that we should close one eye and expect illumination through the other one. Nor does it seem to imply uh, that there is any ordinary organ of sight that is single. The only eye single we can conceive of is the one that Descartes found because it is the only unpaired organ in the brain. It is single. It also is composed of exactly or very nearly exactly the same materials as the optic nerve. Therefore, that it is a potential eye. And in a few uh, small forms of life, I uh, could suggest perhaps that the gasteropodia is one of them, if that will help anyone, that in this particular, uh, in these very primitive forms of life, there are still cyclops. There are still forms of life today that have one eye. And where they have that one eye, it is certainly and undeniably uh, the eye which is now represented to us for the pineal gland. It is not the type of eye that we otherwise have. It is also present under a thin veil in certain forms of horn toads. And it is present uh, in the central upper part of the skull, not where the ordinary eyes of the creature would be. That all such uh, facts are available, and many others, might well cause us to pause and inquire concerning this eye single. We find it occurring again in the Scandinavian sacred writings, uh, the story of Odin and his single eye, how in searching for truth he went to Mirma's pool at the bottom of the tree of life, and there the god of all memories of things told Odin that he would give him the gift of insight if he would pluck out one of his eyes and cast it into the pool of memory. And when Odin had only one eye, he was enlightened. And from that time on, when all father wandered the earth, concealed as a man, he always allowed a heavy lock of his hair to fall over one side of his face to cover the fact that he had only a single eye. This one-eyed god has been called the sun god, and many ancient people insist that the, the sun deity is always properly represented with one eye. In the Kabbalah of the Hebrews, the God of Israel, which neither slumbers nor sleeps, is always presented symbolically in profile, so that only one eye is visible. The same situation also falls into the deck of cards, which was an ancient symbol. And you will note that in the court cards, some are in profile and some in full face. This is by meaning or purpose, and not by accident. Thus we have enough lore and legendary to support Descartes' thinking and to suggest that in his time lore and legendary were probably the most common sources of information available to him. That he would naturally derive from the backgrounds of things known that which he desired to know. The pineal gland then does still carry to us, and even to scientific men, uh, the simple possibility that it could be an eye. There is nothing to deny this possibility, that it is an eye which has retired into the brain, and the brain has closed around it, and the skull has closed over it, and its sight power has ceased. We might also come to the rather simple su supposition that if this was a prehistoric or primogenical eye, 
belonging to some actually ancient and remote period, and having no further use for man because his other eyes are so excellent and efficient, that this gland would atrophy. That which is no longer needed or useful to man seldom remains. But this gland does not do this. This gland remains in some way perfectly healthy down through time, although we don't use it. Its other surface services to mankind are sketchy, still the cause of continuous controversy, but that it is possible that this gland is an eye, that it does have enough structure to cause even a scientist to admit that it could possibly have visual power, but that this power is no longer active, but rudimentary traces of it can still be seen in reptilia even to the present time. All this adds up to one uh, question. If this gland is an eye, is it likely, possible or reasonable, that nature preserves through the ages an eye that sees nothing? Uh, if a fish is left for a while in the cave of Kentucky or breathes there, after a few generations these fish are all blind because there is no light. And uh, this type of thing has been observed everywhere. But this eye in the brain does not seem to thus deteriorate. It leaves us with a very interesting speculation. Obviously, this eye is not particularly useful in adding up grocery bills or other what we might term highly practical pursuits. But we do have a term which comes from somewhere, and we're not even too sure where it comes from, but it has gained uh, popular acceptance through time, and that term is insight. Now, if we have any part of man's optical equipment uh, that could possibly have a different function or a different purpose to see something not otherwise visible, to see inward rather than outward things, to see qualitative rather than quantitative forms, to become aware, because our word see no longer simply means visual acceptance or visual reaction. When a man listens to what you say and he says, I see what you mean, he is not looking at anything. It is insight that he is trying to tell you, that he has become aware. Descartes was convinced that this gland was a field of awareness, and that by its own proper nature it was aware of those things of which man is not normally aware, and that man actually, for all of his objective awareness, is utterly dependent upon the contribution of a kind of awareness which he does not even recognize or understand, an awareness inward into value. This kind of sight is a sight into principles, and it may also imply more things. It may imply a sight outside of the sensory range of the five sensory perceptions that we now know. It may represent a connection to a vibratory band which man is unable to recognize, know, or cognize in any other ordinary sensory perception. This would be quite reasonable and philosophically sound because it is obvious that man must have some co cognition beyond senses. If he does not have a cognition beyond senses, he is doomed to live and die in a sensory universe with no means of escape. This was not nature's intention. The individual, in order to be more than he is,
must have an awareness greater than is commonly available to him. He may not call upon this awareness. He may not even know that it exists. But unless it does exist, a very subtle evolutionary process in the life of the individual is frustrated. There is no escape from what Buddha called the machine of the five senses. This machine is a squirrel cage. And no matter how much we use these five senses, or how skillfully we use them, we can never see anything except that which is outside of us and around us. And from the reaction to the things brought to our attention by the physical senses, we create the mental instrument. And the mental instrument, therefore, is absolutely locked in the processes of the sensory perceptions. Thus man can never know more than his five senses report to him. He can never come to a conclusion more vast than their testimony. He can never escape from their tyranny, and he can never avoid or evade the inevitable pressure of their authority. Well, this actually cannot be true. Consequently, man must have some means of cognition which is beyond the sensory perceptions as we know them. This means of cognition could very easily and very well be associated with the comparatively rare phenomenon of what is termed extrasensory perception. Now, extrasensory perception as a term is again suffering from this tremendous determination to make everything scientific. Extrasensory perception today is being approached as lands were approached 25 years ago, as an interesting and wonderful possibility by means of which we hope ultimately to cure the, co the, hum the common cold, prevent mumps, or do something of that nature. Again, it has no essential meaning unless by means of it we can learn to read our neighbor's bank book or something of that nature. It is a scientific curiosity. And science is now sitting around trying to figure how we can capitalize it, how we can make it profitable, how we can use it to raise the standard of living or also indirectly to raise the cost of living, although that is what might be termed a concealed purpose. Extrasensory perception is not merely what we commonly think of when we uh, read an article on ESP. Extrasensory perception is the same thing that has been recorded from the beginning of time in the visions of mystics the strange psychic experiences of saints, uh, the mysterious revelational factor referred to by Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, another great church philosopher, did as much as he could within the boundary of the framework of his permitted thinking. In other words, there were things he could not do because in his time men just did not do things that were contrary to their faith. It wasn't even a matter of persecution entirely. It was just simply that the human consciousness would not open itself to conscience reflexes by going outside of that which it regarded as right. Therefore, Aquinas was cramped a little in his philosophy and in his research. But he did recognize what he termed the validity of a sixth sense. We had the five ordinary senses, and he gave to, the, to us another sense, uh, which he summarized in the concept of revelation. In other words, there was a way of apperceiving as well as perceiving. There was a way of knowing above as well as a knowing below. There was a knowledge to which man ascended, carrying with it a mysterious power or capacity within himself to receive 
from what perhaps Aquinas would term deity, a kind of instruction which he could receive entirely apart of from the physical senses which might allow him to read a book or listen to a professor give a learned address. Man with his outer ear could listen to the words of other men, but with an inner ear he could listen to the word of God, or what he termed God, which simply meant the voice of superior, that which was above or more uh, subtle, or more internal than the ordinary methods of accepting knowledge. Thus man could achieve through reason, which would be the climaxing of all faculties and their coordination, or he could receive through inspiration, which was a descent a power of a divine life principle which could impart knowing. That which man gained, we will say for the moment, through his ordinary eyes, gave him a certain lockedness in matter. What we see, we believe. You cannot tell us this world is not here, we see it. You cannot tell us our friends do not look the way they appear to look because we can see them. Also, we can see real estate. We can see a good investment. We can see all kinds of external things, families, friends, employment, all kinds of external situations are rationally conveyed into us through the sensory perception and we accept them. We accept them with the peculiar intensity which has made materialism possible as a code of life. Without the tremendous validity of the physical sensory perception, man could never have been a materialist. Materialism was simply the fact that he wanted to believe that the world in which he lived was the world which he could see. And he could not rationally place an invisible world which he could not see above the visible world which he could see as a level of value. Havelock Ellis, in his Dance of Life, explains a mystical experience which happened to him. To him, this was now a more authentic way of seeing. That which was internally experienced, both visibly and audibly, this unfolding of a factual power, a power so real that the things thus seen could be as indelibly fixed upon consciousness as the things seen by the physical sensory perception. Thus the internal experience makes man as certain of idealism as the outer sensory perception makes him certain of materialism. And having once inwardly seen that man can no more deny what he has seen than the individual who sees outwardly and therefore cannot deny what he has outwardly seen. The intensity of this inner seeing also carries with it a dynamic which physical seeing does not carry. Plotinus points this out, where he says that although in his lifetime he had only on one or two occasions been given this moment of illumination, that from that time on the material world in which he lived could never again possess him. This experience inwardly was so great that even a long lifetime of habitual uh, objectification back into the sensory world could never for even a moment cloud this other thing, this greater thing which he had seen and known. Ellis tells us practically in the same words, where he tells us that this experience which occurred to him in almost an inconceivably rapid instant of time 
was of such tremendous intensity and validity that it could never be forgotten and that as a person he could never have the attitudes again which dominated him prior to this experience and it would not be necessary for the experience to be repeated it was indelibly set upon consciousness now such an experience as this must be regarded as either metaphysical or simply uh, superphysical if we wish to assume that without any peculiar or convenient machinery by a grace of deity by the intercession of some spiritual power the perceptions of man can be miraculously quickened so that to a person for no reason perhaps that he can understand or for no rational uh, purpose that he can define a mystical experience can happen to him perhaps cannot happen to another person so that by some miraculous intercessional power ten people a hundred people in a thousand years can have this valid experience this is one view on the matter the other view which probably has a little better philosophic content is that these experiences so described are possible to all human beings just as certain attainments in this world are possible to all human beings but that only to certain persons under certain conditions do the experiences actually occur also we know that within a body of society we have one group which we may call normal we have another group which lies below normal which is a kind of subnormal pattern representing psychological infancy or immaturity that we then also above normal have an ascending order of superior types superior not possibly not possibly according to some ma materialistic measuring rod but superior either in psychic chemistry or in some internal spiritual grace and that therefore some persons <coughs> have developed or unfolded their natural potential so that experiences are possible to them at a given time but that these experiences are possible to all men at some time because the structure for the experience does exist in all if such is the case then the pineal gland is a prime candidate for being involved in this a superphysical situation a situation that is not miraculous is not mystical essentially mysticism being only a term by which we try to explain something not generally understood or cognized but remembering one of the really wise statements of Aristotle where he says that when physics is properly understood there will be no further need for metaphysics in other words metaphysics is merely a term to cover the undiscovered facts of physics and that the entire procedure is a perfectly orderly one and that this orderliness seems to suggest that the pineal gland is in some way a controller that it is in some way a door by means of which certain experiences of inward consciousness may be transferred downward into objective existence it is possible also that this gland is the secret of your sleep dream phenomena 
and that it is this gland which makes the dream remembered or forgotten when we awaken. It is this mysterious gland by means of which that which is not normally available to the sensory perceptions may be impressed upon them from within, particularly in the form of a visual or auditory experience. Thus that certain things are seen inside, other things are seen on the outside, and the inner sight may likewise be involved in your psychological processes. And it is very possible that your so-called hypnotic drugs and certain researches that are now being carried on in drugs dealing with psychic stimulus, that these operate because in one way or another they affect the rhythm of the pineal body. The problem of anesthesia and many others, even hypnosis, may lurk in this area where a tremendous amount of research must still be done. Now we don't want to entirely uh, devote ourselves to this one structure, but uh, the reason why it seems most valuable to us is because it is still the one around which mystery lingers, which has not been as yet explained, and for which perhaps no adequate explanation can be discovered without the aid of mysticism or philosophy as we know these terms today, that they do represent, therefore, uh, our present approach to this situation. Now it is not known with certainty in the extrasensory perception field that the activity of this body can be stimulated. Most of the sensitives who have been worked with at Dukes and other places were natural. Their own abilities differed in various instances. A continuous practice or some special effort to increase the extrasensory perception did not generally succeed. Thus, the situation seems to be beyond ordinary control. And the answer must certainly be, therefore, that it is not specialization by volition, but some type of psychic chemistry resulting from the ennoblement of the entire life that must contribute to the intensification of this body. Physically, the pineal gland is associated undoubtedly with the controlling factors of growth. Therefore, uh, they, uh, this growth process in the terms of the pineal is not merely the distribution of certain secretions to cause the rapid development of body structure. This is only a secondary. Uh, perhaps negative reflex of the gland's action. The positive aspect of it is that it is a releaser into the body of the consciousness factor. If the shock of adjustment is too great at any time, a death is likely to ensue, or at least a serious mental nervous condition develops. This again was, exp uh, was explained by a series of circumstances noted in clinic. One of these is the case I have mentioned before of the small boy who grew up in a few months. He grew from being a child to a man in less than six months. At the end of a little period shortly thereafterwards, he also died. Uh, the sudden development of the body at a tremendous rate of speed. Not only the body, but the mind. This mind became equivalent to the rapid growth of the body, so that in six months the mind attained a basic maturity that would normally have required 15 to 18 years. The child became mentally a man with a man's attitudes, his approach to life, his acceptances, 
his thoughtfulness and all of the elements, elements with which we associate the normal state of maturity. Um, Post-mortem proved that this boy had a, a kind of abscess or tumor on the pineal gland. And evidently, as a regulator, it lost the power to regulate the growth process. Not simply the body, but the growth of the being in the body. Meaning, of course, only one thing, namely an unbalance in the link by means of which being operates upon body, which permitted being to move into body too rapidly and without adequate controls. And the result, the destruction of the body. So that the gland, therefore, has, through clinical research, more or less supported this presumption or the supposition that it has a regulating effect and that consciousness itself is in some way released into the general structure through this important glandular center. The ancients, if we can still borrow them a little for further thinking, had much to support this in their legends and their lore and their myths. Uh, in a way, this gland seems to play the part of the two-faced Janus, the deity which uh, the Latins regarded as the lord of peace and war. This deity had two faces, one facing forward and the other backward, one assumably facing outward and the other inward. And that this de deity represented this gland which has two processes within it. One is that in its being faced outward, it bestows a superior cognition upon things outwardly seen. And when faced inward, it bestows an intuitional or inspirational insight into the causes of things and into the nature of self that in both cases this function is more or less occurring all the time. And what we do not realize, I suspect strongly in our psychology and other researches, is that man is now, for the most part, looking both ways at once, but as yet has not been able to reconcile the mental confusion resulting therefrom with the result that we use now the insight that we possess merely to interpret the functions of the outer sensory perceptions. We have not recognized that they possess a power or purpose of themselves. Now in the brain also there is this other small body which is called the pituitary body. Perhaps one of the simplest things that we can liken it to is one of the retorts of an old alchemist. It looks very much like a bottle. It has an anterior and a posterior part and secretes a material which is called pituitrin. This gland was likewise of great interest to the ancients. We do not know just exactly why they were so fascinated by it, but we can have a suspicion or two about this particular thing. In the first place, the pineal gland is in its shape very definitely a masculine symbol. Uh, the pituitary body is a feminine symbol. It is a receptive symbol. And uh, long ago it was assumed that in the human brain there were two uh, mysterious bodies resembling embryos and that one of these was male and the other female, and that all mental or conscious process of the human being was the result of a generation taking place, a process taking place between the male and female polarities in the brain, and that these polarities were represented by these two glands. Thus, in the Parsival story, uh, the 
pineal gland plays the part of the sacred spear of Longinus, the centurion. And the pituitary body takes the part of the sangreo, or the holy cup. These two being the wonderful relics of the ancient faith that were preserved in the castle on the top of Mount Salvat in Moorish Spain. Always this castle is on the top of the mountain, and in most of the representations of it, it is a domed building, perhaps slightly resembling our grand old uh, planetarium out here in Griffith Park. But it was always a domed building, and this domed building was the brain. And it was here that the knights of the mysterious uh, service of the Grail gathered for the uh, celebration of the Eucharist, seated around this great table, much as in the table of Arthur, king of Britain, the table of Camelot. And here also we have the same mystery as the twelve paladins of Charlemagne, the twelve knights who represented the servants of the San Grail mystery. And we have, of course, the orders of the quest. We have man searching for the mystery of the Holy Grail and the Spear of Longinus. It is also noted that in the case of Parsifal, uh, when Amfortis, the second king of the Grail, took the Holy Spear down into the valley to use it against the evil magician Klingsor, he threw the spear at the magician, who, however, caught it and threw it back, wound, wounding the Grail King with his own spear. This was much made of in the mystical legends, for it represented the danger of using this power for a destructive purpose, even though that destructive purpose seemed to be justified. In other words, reality will never be discovered by violence, even if it is a violent effort to discover reality. It just cannot be done that way. Two wrongs cannot make a right. They simply make two wrongs and things get worse. But the story of the Grail and the Holy Spear also will be found in the legends of alchemy, where we have the, the mysterious processes necessary to the perfection of the wise man's stone, the mysterious symbol of the immortal soul consciousness of man. The pituitary body, therefore, is known to secrete a mysterious dew that is called the brain dew in the Kabbalah and plays a very important part in the distribution of energy. The great uh, Belgian chemist, Jean Baptiste van Helmont, declared the mystery of dew. He said that dew captures in it the rays of heaven. And the brain dew uh, of the uh, ancient Kabbalists is supposed to have been impregnated with the energy of the pineal gland and flowing from the pituitary body. This dew, which has then become the carrier of the consciousness of the pineal gland, is then distributed throughout the body, carrying with it certain power, certain meaning, certain consciousness factor, perhaps something we do not even suspect, namely that it may bestow a kind of conditioned consciousness upon even the smallest cellular unit in the body. Now in the case of the pituitary body, we have certain uh, definite indications that this gland will affect health, uh, that it can be held as a physical growth controlling factor, even as the pineal is a consciousness growing factor. So that we seem to have here the master glands of a system, by means of which consciousness and body are held in equilibrium, and by means of which also uh, the purposes of consciousness and psychic energy are distributed throughout the body. This gives us a possible conscious definition, namely that in the, in the pineal gland we have the seat of consciousness 
or the focal point by means of which consciousness and body meet. And in the pituitary body, we have the seat of psychic knowing, this thing that we call the soul. That therefore, psychic phenomena in general and the disturbances of the psyche in various psychological problems may ultimately be traced definitely to the pituitary body where we have certain danger of aberration. That aberration may arise in the pituitary and clarification in the pineal has been suspected for a very, very long time. The development of the pituitary body also seemingly has a, a very strong bearing upon the sense of smell that in some way this gland was anciently controlled or directed by means of what were called fumigations. In other words, incense, uh, various types of odors, as in the story of the frankincense in religion, that the pituitary body responded primarily to the vibration of odor and that it can be affected and modified in its function by various odors. That as a reaction to this, it means a certain kind of vibration. For odor is, the, is only possible as the result of vibration. The gland in its normal function has also a body normalizing factor and in cases of disturbance of this gland, we have the tendency perhaps to, uh, to obesity or perhaps again uh, to extreme thinness and loss of bodily uh, quality and uh, sufficiency. The gland, when it goes on one of these so-called rampages, uh, produces a distinct physical condition. Now it is also noted that wherever this gland with its physical problem becomes acute, we seem to have an increase in psychic sensitivity. Nearly all psychics have been inclined to be heavy. They have been inclined to indicate that a certain type of sensitivity is to be associated with at least a minor imbalance of this gland. And that where the individual is hale and hearty uh, and the gland is working perfectly, he does not seem to be as much subject to imagination, uh, to violent internal experiences, uh, to a kind of unworldliness of attitude, as we find in a great many uh, persons who have a, a, a heavier physical structure indicating a different uh, pattern of gland function. Also the effect of sugar on this gland will have to be further examined because it does tie up in some way with the pancreas. And it's quite possible that the pancreas represents the lower pole of this gland. The function of the various glands through the body are not too uh, difficult. Most persons have had some fair knowledge of them. Uh, the uh, principal endocrine glands, of course, are, in addition to what we have mentioned, the thyroid, the thymus, the suprarenal cortex, uh, which is really a double structure resting in the form of a gland on the cap of each kidney, and the liver, which is the largest gland in the human body, and uh, uh, the pancreas, which is part, of course, in connection with the spleen structure in its function. These various glands uh, have a controlling or regulating action of one kind or another. Let's try and see if we can investigate them just a little more specially. Suppose for a moment we attempt to study the spleen. 
which is a, a very interesting gland. And in order to study the spleen, we make a very simple experiment. Let us take a small sheet of very thin rubber, uh, say the size of a sheet of typing paper. And with adhesive tape, we bind this over the area of the spleen, covering the skin over the area of the spleen. If we do this, it will not be very long before we will notice some results. The reason we notice the result is that this rubber uh, protective, which we have placed here, is cutting off certain energy rays. The screen, the spleen, is like a kind of umbrella. It is almost like one of these radar devices by means of which we can pick up planes at a distance. The main difference being, of course, that the spleen is primarily concerned with picking up energy, not picking up planes. It is a receiving area into which energy flows. And this energy reaching the spleen uh, begins to nourish or support the etheric magnetic field of the physical body. Thus the spleen is associated with the uh, energy by means of which the vital health of structure is maintained. Wherever there is debility of vital energy, something is wrong in connection with the function of the spleen. But there's no use going and trying to have this diagnosed. Almost anything else will be substituted in the diagnosis. The main fact is that unless the physician follows the Paracelsian corpus and becomes aware that the spleen becomes the gatherer of the energy which becomes the vital principle, that that part of man which corresponds to the plant kingdom is sustained by the spleen. Now the plant kingdom has the power of growth, but not the power of motion. It has the power of color, but it does not possess certain other faculties and powers and the structure of it is quite different from that of the animal, for example. It represents a less complicated organism with less available function, but it does possess the two basic functions, namely growth and reproduction. Therefore, we must express through the spleen the basic energies necessary for growth and reproduction. And also, for color distribution, which the plant has likewise achieved. If then we want to know how man as a healthy plant is proceeding, we have to realize that the growth, energization, representing the plant system comes in this area. I also very strongly suspect that this is the tie between man and what we call cycles of climate, weather, and temperature. Uh, that in this we have perhaps the field in which the actual relationship between sidereal bodies and man is set up. For here it is that the energies and the energy field of the earth continuously being modified by the positions of sidereal bodies that this energy field enters man. Here also we have a sympathetic situation. For here we have what uh, I believe it was our old friend Sir Kemlin Digby back in the good old days who said uh, that sympathy belonged to this area. That the sympathies between things are carried in energy. Therefore, that compatible energies create vital sympathies. And by vital sympathies, we mean the affinities of things for each other, or the power by means of which like and like mingle. 
Perhaps under the heading, therefore, of sympathy, if we wanted a good example of it, we might point out the problem of blood transfusion or infusion. Slightly different in process, but not entirely different in meaning. The infusion would be closer, however, to the splenic factor. But here we have a strange blood introduced into a system. This blood must be overcome by the blood of the person, and its own vital field must be permeated by the vital field of the person receiving the blood. There must be a, an, an electric, vital, magnetic victory of the person over the strange blood which he has received. To a smaller degree, there must be also this victory of the individual over every element of food that he takes in, because he is taking in a dissimilar, which he must make similar, or he can do nothing with it. This similarity factor, this sympathy, appear, appears to be largely under the control of the spleen. If, therefore, this becomes damaged beyond a certain degree, the individual cannot live. This is one of the indispensable parts of man. It cannot be sacrificed. In fact, for the most part, the glands cannot be totally sacrificed. There are one or two that can be, because when that occurs, if it is necessary to remove them, their burden is carried to another gland of somewhat compatible purpose, as, for example, the uh, transference of the responsibility, mutual transference between thyroid and parathyroid. Each one can take something that is necessary, if needed, and the glandular system, if deprived of a function, redistributes that function over the surviving glands, if it is possible to do so. Some, however, this cannot be done with. And anything happens to these glands, uh, there is no answer. If the uh, kidneys are, a kidney is removed, the suprarenal is generally left, because it is not possible to spare some of these glandular structures. They are too subtle. Yet we are not aware of why they are so necessary. Now the liver is the largest gland in the body and is also probably one of the most abused. We uh, recognize in the liver, in the apex of the great body of the liver, the great lobe, the center of, well, for our purposes, let's be rather... Uh, blase and say the center of the beast in us. This is the center of animal life. As the spleen supplies that which is necessary for the continuance of a plant, so the liver provides the extra things that are necessary for the survival of an animal. Without the liver, man as an animal can't make it. Therefore, the liver has to do with the warm blood factor by which an animal is distinguished. The liver, furthermore, has to do with motion. It has to do with motion and emotion. And the entire possibility of man as a warm-blooded creature developing a whole pattern of emotional reactions to motion. The relationship of the entire sensory structure to the blood circulation. In other words, an animal has senses, the same as man. They are not bound by the same coordinator, but the sensory perceptions are there. The animal can see, it can hear, it can feel, it can taste, and it can smell. Particularly in the sense of smell, the animal has tremendous superiority. This superiority can only mean one thing, that in the animal, the pituitary and the liver have formed a companionship far greater than in the case of man. 
in man the power of the pituitary has gradually been shifted to the pineal and as a result of that and many levels of function man is less self-sustaining than an animal perhaps even lacking certain judgment that an animal possesses in a rudimentary way certainly an animal can determine friendship and false friendship more quickly than man it can also uh, find its way home when man is totally lost the animal does possess certain powers and the highest power of the animal uh, seemingly has to do with its psychic propensity which goes back to the uh, pituitary body but we have man as an animal operating through a combination of glands in which the liver and the pituitary constitute dominant factors now uh, where do we find for example the mineral content man is also a mineral man is bone he is substance he is matter he's worth about eight and a half dollars now is pure mineral content uh, he used to be worth only a dollar and a quarter but minerals have gone up since those days also we've discovered a couple of new elements in man that are quite expensive so his value uh, as merely a chemical compound is rapidly rising perhaps he will be ultimately a good investment who knows but the mineral part of man comes back again not so much to the um, endocrine system as we know it but to a degree it gives us a clue to this particular structure actually uh, the mineral part of man is linked directly to the life part actually what is a mineral a mineral is apparently a mass a substance that it has certain energy waves of some kind moving in it is pretty well established because of the crystallization forms which we find in the mineral the mineral is crystallized around energy but the mineral does not move it does not grow it does not reproduce as we know it and it has only a kind of survival with the exception of certain minerals there are links between minerals and plants in the same way that there are links everywhere in nature but the mineral is an existing thing it is alive but it is not living as we know it and this according to the old authorities was due to the fact that the human heart has two complete structures involved in it an internal structure in which life is seated and an exterior field surrounding that structure which is the basis of the form principle that matter is therefore held in cognizable form from the outer magnetic field of the heart therefore actually matter is not uh, included upon glandular in the glandular group even as the ancients pointed out long ago that the physical body is not a principle the physical body is a receptacle only it is not a principle upon this receptacle seven principles operate but it is the eighth sphere or the sphere of their activity matter therefore is a kind of eighth principle directly related to life itself the vibratory polarity of life and matter is in perfect harmony and for that reason the physical body is tied as a living thing to the structure of the core of the heart and as a condition or an enduring form to the outer part of the heart the part the heart contains or controls both of these processes we do however have certain other what you might call luxury processes taking place in man one of them is represented largely by the thyroid now the thyroid gland which of course is located in the throat and has a peculiar structure almost wing-like in appearance 
has long been associated as a gland uh, which has to do with growth, with bodily equilibrium, with body chemistry, and perhaps generally speaking, it is a sort of pacemaker. Uh, the thyroid is a sort of district manager. It is up to the thyroid to accomplish at given times and under given conditions uh, processes which are imposed upon it by other glands. The thyroid is the efficiency expert in the glandular group. It is the power which takes upon itself many different elements and works them into a proper pattern. And if by any chance this pattern process is, process is lost, a series of glandular reactions of several different kinds appear almost immediately. Uh, in other words, if this gland gets out of equilibrium, the body, so to say, gets completely out of focus with the patterns of its purpose. Therefore, if there be an archetypal pattern of body function, this pattern is enforced by the thyroid. Now, we might say, is the loss of the thyroid, or part of it through surgery, uh, uh, therefore a terrible spiritual disaster? No. If man's spirit could have been destroyed by science or surgery, it would have been gone so long ago we wouldn't any of us have any. These are not disasters, they are inconveniences. And it is undoubtedly true that there are occasions when uh, various uh, parts of man must be sacrificed to preserve the rest. This can happen. And it, as the purpose of man is to experience the growth and development of this world, it is better that he be here to experience than he sacrifice the total experience uh, to preserve some theory about a single part. This would not be considered good, reasonable procedure. Therefore, the thyroid or part of it may be sacrificed. If so, other glands immediately take over to carry this load. And, of course, the load is sometimes partly carried by the liver, partly carried by the parathyroids, which under normal condition should not have to operate, and partly again by the pituitary. What part of it is taken over by the pineal we do not know, but there is much to suspect that something could be, for the reason that an archetype or a pattern or a coordinator is the primary function of the pineal. Therefore, this may be a relay station in the pineal chain. In fact, in a funny way, all the glands are relay stations of one gland, the pineal. It is the master of them all. The parathyroids are not supposed to have too much activity under normal conditions as the child develops. But we do have now some problem which involves the element of heredity. We have a problem in which uh, the child in a certain early period in life seems to receive and be sustained by a parental energy. Up to a certain time the child is unable to carry its own energy requirement. And this energy requirement is reservoired in the parathyroids and in the thymus. These glands operate, therefore, under certain stress patterns, and especially the thymus. It is assumed that as the child grows older, that this gland will gradually cease to function. And where it does not cease to function at the time when it should, there seems to be a retarding of the development of the person. Now this retarding by a hyperthymus condition 
has been a subject of a great deal of thought and discussion. But again, we have not arrived at any two positive conclusions. Uh, the general tendency seems to be to feel that the continuation of this glandular process beyond its time may result in a lingering psychic relationship with parent. In other words, uh, if you have a condition which you might call psychic dominance, or if you have a condition in which two identical twins are constantly psychically aware of the condition of each other, or you find a peculiar psychic sympathy between people so that they seem to know each other's thoughts or emotions, particularly as a result of long association, people sort of growing together, growing like each other growing so that they almost have one mind between them, or one set of reflexes. It is suspected that this has to do with a, an unusual lingering of the thymus function, and that uh, this function, therefore, impairs, if it is extended, impairs the assertion of individuality, that the individual never quite comes into possession of himself as he should, if this gland lingers in its functioning beyond a reasonable length of time. Usually the activity of this gland is pretty well exhausted by the time the child is seven years old. But there are cases where it is not exhausted, and we have an involved and complicated psychological situation that can result from this perpetuation. Thus, it becomes obvious that there can be a valid link between glandular function and disposition, temperament. This ease, which we call disease, is really a kind of psychic discomfort. The, the being is not at ease. This at easeness. Uh, will also often reflect the function of the adrenal uh, materials, particularly uh, the adrenaline in the body. The suprarenal cortex, therefore, has been likened uh, to the gland of internal security. There are people who seemingly are undaunted by circumstances. They remain almost continuously sufficient for all of their needs. Needs as people, needs in emergency. These are assumed to possess an exceptionally uh, well-developed and balanced uh, suprarenal process. When the individual is under tension, stress, anxiety, or particularly in danger, or feels themselves to be in a predicament or in a disaster, the tendency is for adrenaline to develop and flow more rapidly. Thus it has been called the courage gland, because it is this flow of adrenaline which gives the individual the sudden power to meet emergency. When this gland operates normally from a reasonably healthy organism, it gives the person that necessary push that takes him through a situation, whatever that situation may be. Nature has provided him with a reserve energy center by means of which he can meet a stress of unusual intensity. It may, however, be that through continuous emotional stress he exhausts this. If he does, then this energy is no longer available because he has wasted it. It therefore is very important in the life of the individual that he does not permit himself to become overwhelmed by small problems. If he is so overwhelmed, he will have very little energy resource when a major emergency arises. This gland sort of gives the person the push that takes him over the top. 
in whatever his problem may be. It is the same kind of result, almost, that the that the old in old times uh, carters got by beating a horse, whipping a horse. The spurt of energy by means of which the horse was able, uh, under cruelty, perhaps to achieve the end that was desired. But of course, the life of the horse was shortened, and its health was ultimately destroyed. But this gland pr uh, provides the whip of energy by means of which a sudden emergency can be met. Nature, therefore, has provided even for contingencies of this kind. We must sometime recognize that these glands constitute specializations of energy, that they are in a very large measure uh, much, uh, some, uh, very much like the chakra situation. In fact, in some groups, of st among some groups of students, the glands and the chakras are very closely related. I do not think this was the original intent, however. I think the glands represent another uh, group of factors. Uh, Plato was of the opinion that the entity or the power uh, in man controlled by means of eight powers or eight extensions and these extensions form the mysterious symmetrical solid called the Doab, which was the symbol of the soul. The eight powers of the psychic or of the internal self. Now we have to be a little careful because the word soul does not mean quite the same in Plato as it does in Christianity, for example. By soul, I think Plato probably meant what we call consciousness, because Plato does not use the word consciousness. Therefore, I think to the Greek, this concept of consciousness or the ensouling power, rather than soul as we think of it psychologically, that this ensouling power manifested through a septenary and one more, the eight that the septenary represented essentially the glandular system, the eighth representing the outer body of the heart which supplied the physical body, the eighth being the body itself, the lost sphere or the underworld of ancient philosophy which would be corresponding to body. So that the septenary of the glands represent a kind of chord, a musical uh, scale, a group of vibratory rates which the old Egyptians and Chaldeans tied immediately to the planets which they regarded as in turn the seven spirits before the throne of consciousness. Thus the glands represent the elaborate chain work by means of which consciousness plays upon the body as upon a musical instrument causing all of the most subtle variations of its own purposes uh, to be available in body process. This process means not so much merely physical control as the release of consciousness in its various aspects through all of the activities of body. We think of consciousness largely as merely supplying us with certain spiritual volitions, uh, supplying us with certain uh, intellectual intensities by means of which we are inspired to do this or that or something else. But that is only consciousness on one level of expression. Consciousness must be present in the cell. Consciousness must be ever present. Consciousness must be present in process. And by means of this group of, uh, of glandular structures, the uh, possibility of this direct involvement of consciousness in every aspect of the body appears to be sustained. Now it was anciently noted also that actually the glands in the body are reflexes of polarities set up in the pineal gland itself that the gland itself is a sevenfold structure. 
that the light or magnetic energy which emanates from it is in the form of a spectrum and that in this spectrum uh, there are the uh, planet-like cores uh, by means of which the gland is tied to each one of the body glands below it. Thus the actual uh, contact is of course vibrational, it has to be. But there has to be the vibratory power in that gland in order to create the reflex as in the tuning rock or tuning fork in each of the other glands which is vitalized by reflex. Thus the energy moving through these glands really represents the motion of consciousness on all of its various levels in the body of man. When you get this entire pattern more or less organized in thinking, we therefore see this consciousness flowing downward through vibratory waves and touching uh, like the rising sun striking the peaks of mountains, first the high points, and these high points in man's function are the glands, later lighting the whole body. Now man's mental nature or the mind-brain pattern forms again a kind of circumference around this so that we have in the heart the core which is life and the circumference which is body. We have in the brain the core which is consciousness and the circumference which is intellect. Now intellect is to consciousness uh, the same principle as body is to life. Because here we have body becoming the instrument of life, mind becoming the instrument of consciousness. Uh, life flows into body, consciousness flows into mind. Mind in turn, by virtue of these relationships, is also capable of a reactional process by means of which thought or sensory perception or experience or attitude goes back or flows back into the consciousness core. By that I mean uh, only one simple uh, situation, namely that the bridge of the pineal carries traffic in two directions. From, it, from, the, from the plus direction, consciousness moves across the pineal uh, to take its mental polarity in the man, in mind and its physical polarity in the glandular system. At the same time, the body reflexes and the mental reflexes are carried back into consciousness. And at the dissolution of the body at death, all of these polarities are restored the pineal gland is the last area of activity to remain alive and through this vortex all of the testimonies of the lower sensor centers are carried back into consciousness again. So that it is a two-way road. But behind the glandular system is the real being in the body, operating upon the body moving through the body by means of these highly vibratorially uh, poised centers, each of which has an energy rate. These are all, all this machinery is kept in motion by the vibration of the pineal gland. The moment that ceases, they all stop. But each one has a specialized function to perform, and the coordinated testimony of that function is again returned into the pineal center. Thus, for man, birth or growth, the processes of development, our, con uh, our consciousness moving into body through the glandular system, the process of the severance of man's body from, uh, at death from consciousness is that the consciousness in every atom and cell gradually unites and flows back again as a consciousness experience into 
uh, the pineal center from which it is transferred to consciousness per se and then the gland has fulfilled its purpose but man's being a conscious person in this world is largely a matter of the essential functions of these glands not the superficial function but the essential function about which unfortunately too little is known but about which some very valuable thinking can be done on the basis of analogy and we have enough to support the general picture even on a scientific level but we do not yet have all the information necessary to fill in the details these must come in time but they're going to be too late for tonight so we can't do anything more with it at this time <laughs> so I think we'll call this the class and we'll meet you again with another class a little later but I have an announcement I would like to make and that is that on March 29th at 8 p.m., our friend Dr. Bode is going to give a speech, a talk here, 8 p.m., March 29th, on Indian culture through the ages, and the lecture will be illustrated with films prepared by the government of India, and which are on loan to Dr. Bode for this occasion. It's a, I believe it's going to be rather unusual because I think it's going into all of their crafts and cultures. Uh, their arts and things of that nature and their cultural tradition through the ages it should be a very interesting uh, work and the films of course have been very carefully prepared by the Indian government so I think you will be interested in it and we hope that many of you as can will be here to uh, be with Dr. Bowles on March 29th at 8 p.m. thank you very much